to this MidVision webcast. Today we're talking about the Art of JBoss uh, deployments, and particularly on the EAP platform. Today I'm joined by uh, Rob Vanstone. Rob, would you like to say hello? I think I have you on mute actually at the moment, so you're going to find that hard for a second. Hang on a second. So, as I said, my name's Helen. I head up sales and marketing here at MidVision. And we actually have two of our consultants on the call today. Um, one is Alex Manley, who should be able to say hello, and the other is Rob, who should also be able to say hello. So, Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Alex Manley, a technical architect here at uh, MidVision. Hi, I'm Rob Vanstone. I'm a principal consultant here at MidVision. Thanks, guys. So this uh, webcast is intended to last around 45 minutes today, so we have a few slides to position what we're talking about, and then we're going to move into a demonstration, um, which uh, Rob will drive today. So um, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about why our customers um, look at deployment automation and kind of drivers that, that make them uh, able to write a business case for their investment. And then we're going to talk about the architecture of Rapid Deploy itself, and then more specifically about the JBoss EAP plugin. And then Rob will do a demonstration, as I said, and then we'll have a quick chat at the end about the kind of things that people do next. So first of all, when we talk about um, the business benefits of ARA, it's, it's all deployment automation. It's worth talking about the maturity scale that we see in the market today. So um, kind of at the bottom level, what we see are people that are doing everything manually around their deployments. And then what often happens is someone thinks, well, I could automate that bit, so I'll just write a script. And then they write another script and another script until suddenly they have lots and lots of scripts. And then what we see with some customers is that they then decide to actually start building some tooling themselves around that bunch of scripts that they have. And that could be something like um, developing a graphical user interface. It could be doing some integration into other tooling that they have, like a build engine or an SDM tool. Um, or it could be something like building some kind of security or workflow around that um, set of scripts. And then at the top level, um, it won't surprise you to hear that we consider a vendor managed tool to be the top level of maturity, and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, we have a number of customers worldwide who we actively elicit um, feedback into our product development roadmap. So we consider ourselves the most innovative um, in the market in terms of this type of solution. Um, and that's really the, the kind of maturity scale. So the kind of things that people say, oh, we've got all these scripts and they're doing the automation, but they're actually causing us lots of problems. Scripts do tend to go wrong, and they do um, still t quite time consuming, obviously less time consuming than a pure manual effort. Um, but people want to be more productive. They're under more pressure from the business to deliver more innovation to their own customers. These are the kind of drivers that, that push people forward. The other thing that we see is a lot of our customers, um, particularly in the finance and the healthcare sector, are um, under a lot of regulatory requirements. They have a need to prove their compliance to certain processes. And our tool enables um, you to record absolutely everything that's done in the system, when it happened, who did it. Um, with one of the banks recently that we work with, the auditors came in and we were able to spin up an environment that they had three years ago and show the auditors exactly what that looked like. So this slide is from a Hurwitz report a couple of years ago, and it, we use this a lot at, at early stage um, with customers when we're starting to build business cases with them, and every customer is different. Um, some customers are simply looking for time reduction. Some people are looking for potentially resource reduction. Others know that they're going to have a, a, significant, number of, um, a significant increase in the number of applications that they're going to need to manage with the same number of resources. Um, others know that they have a big project coming up, like a middleware upgrade or something, and these are the kind of things that drive them forward and where they might see the cost saving. And the point about the middleware upgrade project is quite important. So it's quite rare for us to see a pure deployment automation project standing alone. What normally happens is that a customer will have something else that they're going to do, and maybe they're building a pad or a private cloud. The middleware upgrade project, for example, they could be re-architecting or upgrading a business system. And I've uh, 
a uh, period of 10 years. And recently, we've um, we've uh, componentized um, the uh, the architecture uh, into plugins. So we have our core framework, um, which is the base framework. We have a web application where we can um, edit our projects. We can um, uh, add uh, different functionality depending on which plugins we add to this framework. Uh, we have different types of plugins. So we have uh, our target plugins, which are the target platforms and the target systems that we're dealing with. These may be uh, JBoss uh, EAP, JBoss Application Server, um, WebSphere MQ, WebSphere Application Server. Um, you know, there's a number of target plugins that we uh, have in our portfolio. And we then have transport plugins, which is the mechanism that we use to talk to the remote um, system. So from the framework server, from the core framework, we then, when we do a deployment and we run a job, we then have to connect remotely to uh, a, another host. And there are currently two mechanisms to do this. We've got um, SSH, um, secure shell connection, or we have a remote agent, a secure remote agent connection, which um, you have a small remote a Java remote agent running on that target machine that you connect to. Uh, more recently, we've uh, we've had some, uh, we've developed some cloud plugins. So we have uh, plugins to some cloud providers such as Amazon Web Services, so that we can uh, talk and spin up some instances in the cloud. We can then. Uh, use those um, uh, servers to uh, connect to and um, use and deploy uh, code and configuration to. The next uh, set of plugins, uh, we call it toolchain plugins, but it's actually broken down into a number of areas. So for toolchain, we're talking about um, build toolchain. So you start with your um, SCM, your source control management. So we have things like um, GitHub, SVN, ClearCase, um, they're common um, source control tools that we integrate into. Um, we have artifacts uh, repository tool chain. So once you've built your code, it's your, your artifacts are stored in a repository. Now this may be Maven, uh, maybe um, Nexus uh, artifactory. It may just be a flat file system or a, a remote file system. Um, we have build engines that we integrate with, so um, you may want to kick off a build through Rapid Deploy, which would then uh, create your um, your deployable artifacts, which are stored in your repository. So we use typical ones like Jenkins, um, Hudson, um, Rational Team Concert. Um, I'm just trying to think of the other ones. Uh, anyway, there's quite a few. Um, and then finally, uh, no, that's it actually for the tool chains. Um, so source control, um, artifact repositories, and build engines, really. And then the next set of plugins we have, um, we call business intelligent plugins. So we've got plugins where we can um, have uh, reporting plugins, and you can build your own reports if you want, which will then interrogate the uh, rapid deploy data base and so then you can create reports to you know understand how many deployments have happened into live or um, how many uh, deployments certain projects has had. Uh, you can develop your own reports. We've got comparison uh, plugins so you can compare packages. Um, so you may have a deployment package one and a deployment package five. You may want to see the difference between those packages. Uh, we can um, use those plugins. So we've built this architecture where we can, as more and different technology comes along, we can plug it into our framework. Do you want to go on to the next slide? Yeah. So <clears throat> this, okay, this is um, a bit more detail of the previous slide, really. So in the core framework, uh, we have the ability to um, execute deployments, um, for the deployment to use to install app systems, uh, we can uh, deploy configuration, 
um, deploy applications into application servers. We have a workflow. Uh, we can schedule jobs. We can uh, visualize environments. So we can visualize for a given project which servers they talk to, which environments, which applications are deployed to those environments. Uh, we have the ability to take snapshots of um, environments. So these can be file system snapshots or depending on the technology, we may use uh, underlying um, JMX calls to those systems to get um, internal data uh, of configuration. We do that for WebSphere, for example. Um, we can import environments and we can also uh, do physical discovery, which, which is basically we run a job on a remote system to query uh, what the OS is, what the level of the OS is, and we can record that back into the core framework. And with the plugins that I've talked about them earlier, um, but they're the different plugins that allow give you different functionality. Okay. Great. So um, here is uh, DevOps is a big buzzword at the moment, and we do fit into into development and operations because we're doing deployment, and we we integrate with the development side of things because we integrate with the build engines, the source control engines and the DSL, the Artifact Repository. So DSL is the Definitive Software Library. So developers will check in their code into source control. Um, normally a build engine will be used to take that source control uh, code and it will build an artifact. That's then stored in the um, uh, Definitive Software Library. Um, and then with the um, deployment configuration code, we use Rapid Deploy to create the configuration, which is again stored in source control, and then with the artifacts from the developers, which may be a WAR file or an EAR file that you want to deploy, <coughs> we incorporate that with um, the deployment configuration and create a package that we then store in the definitive software library, which is deployed. And then rapid deploy will then go and um, deploy uh, the package to the remote system, and that's normally an operations type job. And we have um, different roles uh, and different types of users that are allowed to do different functionality within Rapid Deploy. So usually it's the release engineer. There are different types of release engineer. So we have a development release engineer, a test release engineer, and a production release engineer, depending on which systems they're allowed to deploy to. So. Now, this is uh, a typical um, um, development test to production uh, cycle of continuous delivery. And what we allow is we allow our packages to be built once. And we have the one package that is built that has the configuration of all of the environments that we, go, that we could possibly deploy to. And that one package will be deployed to development. It would be then deployed to test environments, to staging environments, all the way to production. So it will be the same package that will be untampered um, from development to uh, production. And if, if a, a defect is found in any of those phases, whether it's an actual code defect or a deployment configuration defect, then that um, version will be thrown out and then the, it, package will be fixed with a new configuration value or go back to developers to fix the bug. A new package will be created which would then get promoted throughout all of the uh, stages. And so you can be guaranteed that whatever you have in production has been tested in all of your previous environments all the way back to development and it's been untouched. There will be no modifications to that single package. <coughs> So with the JBoss EAP plugin, um, we have um, we've defined a, a JBoss EAP environment where you can set the, most of the JBoss settings that you would um, specify, such as the server base directory, the port offsets, um, the bindings addresses, um, typical JBoss settings that you may configure. You configure that through the tool. Uh, we have also provide a, a, a number of tasks um, that allow you to install, uninstall, uh, deploy applications, deploy um, configuration. We can execute 
command line interface um, scripts, so the standard JBoss CLI tools, we can run those files in. Uh, and we'll go through all that later, but the plugin allows you to uh, install, configure, and deploy uh, into JBoss environments. So, uh, in today's demonstration, uh, we've got some pre built projects that we're going to show you. We've got Rapid Deploy running on a Linux server. Uh, we have a JBoss target that we'll be deploying to. We'll be connecting via SSH to the target. And what we're going to do is install uh, JBoss onto that target. And we'll install the native libraries, which will be the um, ESO files, the kind of like um, shared objects um, for, for Linux. Uh, we're going to secure that instance by adding a management user. Uh, and um, once we've got the um, server installed and secured, we're then going to uh, change some login configuration. We'll deploy a simple wall file, which is a log test application, which uh, uses the login configuration that we've, we've set. We'll show you the application, show you the, the configuration. Um, we'll also show you deploying a um, Oracle modules, and we'll deploy an Oracle data source. We'll show you testing the connection. Uh, and subject to time, we'll show you undeploying the application and uninstalling uh, JBoss. So I'm going to hand over to Rob now, who's going to uh, run these. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to set up my screen so you can all see it. Okay. Right. So, as Alex mentioned, the Rapid Deploy framework, we're running it as a uh, web application. It does have a couple of other interfaces. We have a command line interface and a web services interface for doing some of the internal actions, but the majority of users will come in through the user GUI interface uh, because then you have um, the workflow and user access management that you'd expect from a tool like this. So I'm just going to log into the tool. This is running on Linux and we have we are actually deploying to the same Linux target as well and as I as I mentioned um, the, the, from the login screen different users would be having different roles and we conceive of operators and people who manage the configuration probably having different access within the tools. So some may be able to deploy, some may only be able to uh, change the orchestrations, some may have overall access. It very much depends on your organization. Uh, what we will show today, as Alex has touched on, is we'll install JBoss and configure it and deploy an application to it. And all the while, I'll explain what's going on within the user interface. We won't cover the very basic rapid deploy um, terms and objects, we, but I'll explain where you know where something is is required. So everything within Rapid Deploy is built around something we call a project, and we have a number of projects that that do very different things. And if you think of a project as the what it is we're going to do aspect of a configuration, so it's the set of steps that are needed to do a deployment and the tasks involved in doing those. So that's wrapped around in what we call a project and we have uh, projects for many of the technologies we support. Um, just find one of the ones I want to look at. You notice on this screen that we have the project name and then Along the right hand side we have some of the plugins that we talked about in the presentation. So a project links up with a source control repository and that's in these cases these are all mastered in subversion. It may have an artifact repository, it could be Maven. Um, I won't go over too much stuff we've already covered but in this case we've got our artifacts on the file system. There's a build aspect to it and our technology in this case is JB. So I will open up the JBoss install project. 
Now, what we've done is we've artificially split up our JBoss actions into several different projects just to keep them atomic and to show you the flexibility within the tool. These are fairly uh, well broken down tasks and they could all be run under the same project, to be honest. We could install WebLogic, we could start it, we could deploy to it all in one project, but we've split these out. Now, as I've said, we can configure those different plugins for the tool chain, so the artifact repository and the source control management. Um, but the focus of a project is this orchestration. Now, with uh, Rapid Deploy and with the plugins that you obtain, you are have access to a vast array of pre-built pre-written tasks that have been tested in a number of organizations and these are available to you in a palette on the left for all the technologies that we support and there are some core ones as well so at the at the most the crudest level if I may say that we have an execute we can run a script on a target box um, so if you if you you know built up an orchestration from that you you would have a very good level of orchestration but deeper than that we have tasks specific to a technology these are all Java based tasks and will execute some subset of the types of things you want to do and in this case for our JBoss we've we've selected a number of them these are a mixture of our core tasks and our actual JBoss specific tasks. So we, we're going to create the install directory, for example. Now you might see during this demonstration some um, funny symbols with at signs. A lot of what we do is parameterized so that we recognize the fact that your different environments may have subtle differences between them, but overall they should be identical. Now those subtle differences we can actually render as a parameter and for each environment there will be a dictionary file that will resolve that into a real value. So in your dev system you may have your JBoss installed in, in a different location to your production so we can parameterize that but still use the same project. So this project is going to uh, create a directory, check there's enough space in there, then it's going to install the binaries into that location and what we're going to do, install JBoss, as you know, um, you have a standalone server supplied. We're going to copy that and do all of our work on a test instance. We're going to add an end user to that, and then we're going to add some of the modules to it. So that's what an orchestration is. It does the same thing every time, and I think this is the consistency part of deploy mechanism that we're talking about today. So we will just go ahead and do that. I've got a um, clean system, there's nothing installed on here at the moment in this directory and every time we, we perform a, a deployment it's done exactly the same way. So the actual operators of this environment irrespective of the technologies will be doing the same things each time. So we select our project and we're doing the install. Okay, so we've got a single server here that, we, that we've configured. It's pre-configured um, with connection details and I'll go into that a little bit later. And we have a, a logical construct that takes us down to our specific instance that we want to deploy. In a real production system you would see many many different servers in this list and you would select the one you want or or more than one and we'll talk about that in a second so we've selected the one we want to add and it's at this point if we wanted to add some more we would do so that's if we want to batch them up and then the core concept of our deployment pattern is this idea of a single package a package that could be deployed to your dev environment and to your production environment. The only difference being some of the variables that you've set that differ between those environments. So we have a package that we are 
wanting to test and when it's ready we can deploy it and then move it up through the route to live. So we've picked our package. Um, we could uh, batch up this operation with um, a number of deployments to different target servers. So if you wanted to do all of your development nodes at this point in time, you could. You can add human tasks in here for approvals and you can link them up so that tasks won't execute until the preceding one has. I will just go to the end and confirm this and execute the request. Okay, so we have an executing job now and a number of things start to happen. So one of the first things we do is we make sure that all of our libraries that are required for this task are correct. If they've been copied there before to the target, then they won't be copied again unless they've changed. So we do a check on, the, on those, a checksum, and we make sure everything is in place, including the actual package that we're deploying from, which is this last one. Once the package has been copied over, um, we then go through all of the tasks I showed you in the orchestration. And this is just a visual presentation of those tasks being stepped through. Um, it has completed successfully. If I look in this directory now, we have a JBoss installation, which I assume most of you are familiar with. And we've also done a significant amount of logging as we've gone through this process. So we will look at the log file here. And this is stored for as long as your retention period specifies, but you've got an audit of everything that's happened on this target. So um, it's very verbose. I've got it in debug mode at the moment. So you're seeing a lot of detail. Um, you see the detail from each of our tasks. So we made the directory, we checked for space, we installed JBoss, we created the uh, administration user, and then we copied over some of the um, deployment modules, the native libraries, and, and then we've completed the deployment. So now I have a server, but it hasn't actually started yet. So um, I'm going to, we've got a project with a single task in that will start the server. In fact, that task, I, I won't run that. In the interest of time, I'll go straight to uh, our next use case, which is we're going to change the logging uh, and add a, a file handler to the server and that will start it as well. So I'll just go through that. Um, I'll explain what's going on when I've kicked this off. So again, we select what we want to deploy to, select our package, and I can skip to the finish because I know I'm not going to need to add any further configuration to this. I'll explain in, in a later deployment what some of these mean, um, but we have some provision for changing attributes at deploy time, and there are good use cases for that. So again, this is a second deployment, it's done in exactly the same way, and what this is doing is it's starting the server, and then it's executing um, some CLI commands to add a, a log handler to the console. So that's completed. We now have a running, albeit empty, platform. And if I look at our profile, look at now our logging, 
can see we have a new category that we've added and we'll, we'll use this category in a, in a later deployment. We have a file by size handler and here it is. So we've said, right, we want a rolling log, we've called it production server log, we want three backups and we don't want each log to breach that value. Rob, do you just want to show the uh, log output of that um, previous deployment? Yes, and yeah, I will do. Okay. Okay. So do you want to say something about the CLI? Yeah, so um, with the CLI task, um, so actually, if you just go through this, basically this project, it starts up the server, and then, so you've got this start server task, and what this does, it always checks whether it's running first, and if it's not running, then it will start the server up. So there, here's an exception, because it wasn't running, connection exception, and then it says it's starting in JBoss. And so now it's going to start up, uh, and it will get a message at the end saying it's started. Um, okay, and then it executes, uh, we've got an execute command task, and what this does is it takes standard CLI uh, commands, uh, your JBoss EAP CLI commands, and it takes a flat file and it will run those commands. So if you continue down um, in this log file, we will see uh, the commands that it's about to run. So we can see, sorry, if you just stop there. Just go up, and, yeah, we've got refile, and it says add to size rotating log just above. That's the file that it's reading, and from that, it's getting these commands. So it's got these two commands. The first one you just highlighted, the logging subsystem, uh, and this is just standard uh, JBoss uh, CLI. Um, and again, this is a file that we could parameter, par parameterize. So the name, for example, production server log, we could have made that a parameter, a data dictionary item, and it would have been a different name for a different, uh, a different file name, depending on the different um, environment you de deploy it to. And you can see that it's just running two commands. And then <clears throat> we have um, the ability to say whether uh, we're going to batch up um, these commands. So if you say it is batched, then it will run everything uh, as a transaction, and if one fails, it will roll them back. Otherwise, if you set it to not be batched, then each line will be an atomic transaction. Yeah. So the result of that is now we have um, set up that handler. You've seen it in the console. Within our test server, we have a within our log directory, we now have ready for use our production server log. It's not been logged to yet because there's no applications running to do that. Now that's what I'm going to um, install next is the web application that will use that handler. So exactly the same again. deploy our application. Now we're actually using the same same package each time but that's that's purely because these are all wrapped up in the in the same project. So as I said before we could have done this as a as a, a single project if we wished but we could split these out as as much as you were, want to. Um, some of the some of the attributes here are worth explaining. The the late config is has arised um, typically from a security use case where if you have to put in passwords and they're only released on go live day then we have the ability to keep those blank within the configuration and then possibly someone from security could enter those passwords at the time it's being deployed. Um, we can also make changes to configuration without having to fully repackage all of your source code and um, when we do that we use an existing uh, package that we know works 
that's just had say a Java heap size changed and that means uh, and then we can use the latest configuration just to pull in the configuration for that package and update it. Okay, so what this is going to do, I will uh, actually go to the um, progress panel. That will just give us the the task. We with it with all of our tasks, we start the JBoss server um, because there's no harm in it. If it's already started, it, it doesn't do anything and then we've deployed our WAR file. So if we go through to the console now and look at our runtime, we can see in our deployments we've deployed a, a WAR file and it's our log test application which we will navigate to. Okay. So that's running it's a very simple server. It just updates the log files with different categories using our handler. And we can now see some variety in the log directory. We've got our three rolling logs and then our production server log. Okay. So, um, just to take a, a bit of a recap over, over what's gone on here, you've seen a number of deployments and, and they've implied that we've got a certain amount of configuration. I'll just go through some of that configuration. So again, we can see the projects that we've installed and, we, and, um, and deployed within the project section. That one that we just executed, the deploy application, as I showed you in the pro progress, we did two things. We had a start server and a deploy wall file. This project has associated with it a number of environments. And this is a logical term to describe each and every one of the JBoss servers you might be controlling. So in this case, we were deploying to this server, in this environment, and then instance and application are, are other ways to logically separate these out. Uh, if I talk about the server, as we mentioned in our um, presentation, we have two different mechanisms to communicate to our target servers. We can go via SSH for anywhere that that's installed and we can use our own remoting agent. These are called transports. So you configure your transports as you would expect to. So with SSH, we can use um, SSH keys and passphrases. We're connecting in a brand way. Or we could have chosen a agent uh, mode to connect. An agent is a small Java application running on the target server that's designed to communicate with rapid deploy. Um, each server is associated with environments, so there's a lot of relationship uh, with, within, within this tool and you can navigate to each from, from the other. So if we look at our environment, this is where we configured all of those items that define our, our server instance. So on the product tab, all the things you'd expect, the home, the host name, the starting port, what we're okay. going to offset. Sorry, Alex. I'd like to talk about this a bit. So this is, um, for the plugin, this is actually defining everything that's used to communicate and start up the server and configure the server. So um, you can see we can configure exactly the JVM arguments here. Um, we use the product name, product version to ensure that we've, we, we're installing the right version. 
his name and password is what's used for the um, management user that we um, created. Now, when Rob logged in earlier, I think because you previously logged in, that username and password is cached. So the first time you go in, it asks for a username and password. Um, it's got the default port, that, uh, the JMX port that it connects to, which is defaults to 999. And then we've got the, um, the standard JBoss properties, such as a socket finding offset, uh, which specifies the default ports, what, what number to increment them by for the offset. So you can see where in his JBoss server, um, or if the JBoss application was 8081. Uh, because you've got an offset of one and the default is 8080. And then if you go down, you've got the JBoss properties, and here are the standard properties. Now, uh, we mentioned earlier that we took the standalone directory and we copied that and created a test directory. So the, the server base directory is now in this um, location, which is JBoss EAP6 slash test. And so that's the instance of JBoss that uh, we're working against. And then you can override any of the settings here, but um, I mean, if you click on any of the help items, um, just it then uh, gives you some help about what each of the versions, each of the properties are, and these are all then uh, packaged together in uh, your deployment package. And when you're running a deployment on your target server, this is the information that's used to communicate start, stop, uh, and deploy applications. Bob. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Alex. What what we will do now is we will conf further configure that um, JBoss server, and we will we will add uh, an Oracle data source to it. So we have a, a project which I'll go through as we deploy it in the interest of time. Why didn't you do it via a previous job just to show that you know, different ways of running it? Okay, yeah, no, so obviously before running this um, demo, I have been doing deployments, and so within Rapid Deploy, we have access to all of the jobs that we've run previously, and we can look at the log file for each of them. Um, we can download the log, log file if we want, so that we can uh, send it out for support. And we can replay jobs. So uh, if I find the Oracle database one that I did earlier today, I can configure the Oracle database. I can just hit the play button, and that will redeploy it with the settings that I used before. And then you take into the executing job screen again. And the now very familiar set of tasks that are going to be run and so here we yeah so here we have an actual live instance of the the log so you can monitor the log as it's running through each task okay and then it's completed successfully so I will just navigate to the console again. And now we have um, a RD data source that we've just added. Uh, those, I should have shown you this screen before, but you will have noticed when we were looking at the logging that we, we passed through this page and there was only the example data source. And we can test that connection um, and it's successful. Now that was an example, so we, if I just talk about this, this project right now, um, that was an example of, instead of using the CLI commands, that was a, a pre-written task that we have as part of our palette of tasks. So here we have the Oracle driver, and we have a pre-written task to do that. So you supply a, a very minimal set of parameters to it, and it will create the driver that you need. And notice that we parameterized all of these. 
Um, to talk about these parameters, if I show you the environment again, so here we have the environment that we've been talking about throughout this demonstration. This is all the structure within source control that that we manage. So this project has a set of files, the application, the war file, if you, if you want to drop it there at build time, and other resources. And, and just so that you know, you can see how some of this hangs together. We had those CLI scripts, and and that's quite an important point because Alex touched on these are the scripts that we use. So that we added the size rotating log. This is standard JBoss CLI. So if you've already got scripts of this nature, you can still leverage those. And you can parameterize them. Because built within our framework is the ability to change all of these parameters on a per environment basis at deploy time. And they're realized in what we call our data dictionary. Data dictionary is key value pairs. So we've got our Oracle data source and the values that they will resolve for this environment. Now, if we were to clone this environment and build out our QA server, and that's an operation that we do very easily within the tool, then you would change those values and repackage and then push it out. So that's the configuring the Oracle database and covering some of the resources involved in, in deploying this out to the target. Okay. So um, in the interest of time, um, Helen, uh, we have 10 minutes left. Now we can show a demonstration of undeploying the application and uninstalling uh, JBoss. That is not very exciting, but we can do it all or we can open up the floor for a Q&A session. Let's go with the demoing the undeploy, please. Okay, okay so undeploying the application. Um, again, I've, I've done this already today. Um, I will just execute this job and, and monitor the progress. We have a task that will remove that war file from the from the target. And now that it's complete, if I was to refresh this, it's not available any longer. And if we look at the deployments, there are no items there anymore. And then just to wrap this entirely. Um, I will uninstall JBoss. I'll do it the standard way. Okay. And it will be as though we were never here. So I think what, I mean, you've seen a lot of the same activity done over and over again. And, and, you know, this is the point of the tool. We are making the deployments as similar as possible so that fewer errors creep into this activity of change. And we are using the same package to deploy to our different levels of environment. So that's they're the, the key concepts to take away from this. And for JBoss, we've got a lot of pre-written artifacts that we can use to make sure we do the tasks we want to do in the same way each time. But also we've got the flexibility for you to use anything that you've developed in-house and spent a lot of time getting right. You can still incorporate those within this framework. And just as a... Just this directory no longer exists. 
because there's nothing now inside JBoss. We've removed it entirely from our system. Um, all of that could have been done, you know, as one project. So from a provisioning point of view, if you just wanted to quickly get an application out on a on an environment that doesn't even have JBoss on, you can do that with very simple project. And that's the end of the demonstration. Thanks, Rob. So, could you just reiterate what we just showed everybody, please? Yeah, yeah. So, we had rapid deploy running on a Linux server. We were deploying to a Linux server. Um, what we did today was we installed JBoss where there wasn't already wasn't an instance. We secured that instance by adding a management user. Now I'd cached the password, but um, I would have had to have logged into that console. We altered the login configuration to suit a new application that we were deploying, and then we deployed that application. We showed it running, and we altered the configuration again to add a data source, and we tested that, and then we just removed everything. Thank you. So one of the things the guys did a while back is they integrated a database into Rapid Deploy, a hypersonic database, which makes it very downloadable and easy to install. So if you would like to try the product out in your own environment, do drop me a line or go onto our website at midvision.com where you'll find lots of places where you can request a trial.